Welcome back to the first class on the book of Luke for the fall semester of 2024. We're looking at one of the accounts of the life of Christ. Um, most people I think, refer to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the four Gospels. And I kind of hesitate to do that uh, because it sounds like that means there's four different Gospels. And of course there's not. There's only one Gospel. And that's best defined as in 1 Corinthians 15 when it says that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I think it's best to refer to them as the life of Christ. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke have similarities, uh, more so than the book of John. Uh, that's why we refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic gospels. Um, and that they see things the same way more often. Uh, there's no contradictions in these books. Instead, they're enhancements one to the other. You have uh, Matthew that gives a lot of uh, fulfilled prophecy. Mark, you don't have the fulfilled prophecy. Uh, Matthew written to the Jews. Mark written to Gentiles. Gentiles didn't know the prophecy, so therefore the fulfillment of them the fulfillment of the prophecies did not really matter a lot to them at, at this point in time. Uh, they were definitely important, as we'll see here in the book of Luke, with some of the fulfillments on the birth of Christ uh, and the prophecies concerning his childhood and ministry. Uh, Luke uh, is uh, said to be the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. Uh, we know him as a physician. Uh, and so, as we begin here in the book of uh, Luke, we'll see uh, some of the things here is that he wrote to someone named Theophilus. Uh, and he does this not only in the book of Luke, but also in the book of Acts, the only two books that Luke wrote. Now, as far as amount of writing, uh, Luke actually ends up writing most of the New Testament, uh, although he only wrote two books, but because of the size of these books of Luke and Acts. Now, I know some will debate that, and some will say, well, no, Paul wrote more. Uh, well, I do not believe, and of course, 2 Thessalonians 3.17 I do not see any way that Paul could have written the book of Hebrews. Uh, Paul signed all his epistles, and Hebrews is not signed. And so, since he could not be the author, then the, the amount of verses that he wrote are actually less than the amount of verses that Luke wrote. Um, and so, uh, but here we have it written to someone named Theophilus. Now, we don't know who Theophilus was, some debate whether he was an actual person or not. I, I believe he was a person. It's, I believe we take the word of God literally. Uh, but that being said, I think his name is very indicative of who Luke was writing to because his name means uh, one who loves God. Theos means God. Phileo means love. So one who loves God. And in that sense, then the book of Luke is not only written to the single person, uh, Theophilus, in the early church, but written to all those who love God. Uh, there are some very misleading commentaries out there that says that Luke gathered together all his information from other sources in order to write his, the book of Luke, is that he copied from Matthew, Mark, and John and uh, went outside the scriptures to get uh, his information from other people. I do not believe that in any way whatsoever. Uh, I don't see that to me that takes away from the, the inspiration of the scriptures. Uh, I believe Luke got his information straight from God as did Paul and all the other authors of the Bible. Um, but he writes, and he's the only author here to state his purpose of, of writing his book, and it's very importantly is to know the certainty 
of the things that he had been taught. Uh, this is very important verses right here that sometimes are just overlooked. We read them as the introduction to the book and then we get down into the book because we, we think that's more important. But if you think about this, to know the certainty of the things that he had been taught. You know, my job as a teacher that God has called me to do is to teach his word. But the classroom is not the only information that you should be having as far as the Word of God. You should go to the Word of God itself and make sure that you gain from the Word of God. See, what Luke here is saying is not, uh, Theophilus, not, not just the things that you've heard me say or have heard other people say, but go to the source. And the source is the Word of God. That's why you can know for certain of the things. I hear things all the time from people that they say are in the Bible that aren't in the Bible. Uh, you know, I mean, some things like uh, the people say that the Bible says that the lion and the lamb will lie down together in the millennial kingdom. And the Bible doesn't actually say that. Uh, it's just one of those things that people have heard so many times they think it's in the, in the Bible. Uh, we need to find out but what does the Bible actually say? So if you're studying a passage, the first thing that you do is, of course, go to the Bible. And that's, that's your beginning, and that's where you, you pray and ask God to give you understanding of the Word of God. You go to the Scripture Himself, and then if you have a hard time understanding, you might go to someone that you trust, or you might go to a commentary that you trust, and to be honest with you, not a whole lot of commentaries out there that I truly trust. Uh, we use Wilmington's Guide to the Bible here in this college, and the reason that I recommend that because I believe it's the best one book on the whole whole Bible. Uh, now, no no one person can know completely all the scriptures and uh, do a great commentary on all 66 books of the Bible. This is not enough time in our lifetime to do that. Uh, you'd have to spend several years probably on each book. And if it's 66 books, and just a couple of years on each one, it's 132 uh, years you'd have to live. And so obviously you can't know everything about everything. But Wilmington's Guide does summarize it better than any other one-volume commentary on the Bible that I've ever seen. Uh, but you go to the Bible, you might go to a commentary, you go to someone you trust, but more importantly, you pray. And then when you come to the conclusion, make sure your conclusion matches up with the Word of God. That's what Luke is trying to get across the office, to know for sure, know with certainty. The thing that you heard, well, you know, just because you heard somebody say it, does that mean it's true? Well, as my pastor said it. Well, that's great, and he may, he may be right. But if you want to know for certain, you get into the Word of God. And that's the goal of this college, is to get people into the Word of God. Not just take my opinion for it. Uh, there are sometimes in things that the Bible doesn't cover that we do come to a conclusion by our opinions. Uh, but when it's my opinion, then you can take it or leave it. If it's what the Word of God states, then you have to take it. And if you don't take it, then you're going against God Himself. Uh, John says, in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Meaning that the word of God is our physical representation of Jesus Christ in the world today. And so, if you don't trust Jesus Christ, you don't trust the Bible, then where do you stand? And of course you stand on, on sand. You stand on, on loose ground that you're going to fall, because you have to have a solid firm foundation, and that is the Word of God. So Theophilus is one who loves God. You love God? If you love God, this book is for you. Of course, all 65 other books of the Bible are for you as well. Luke, uh, in the book of Luke, uh, the angel, a messenger, the word angel, remember, means messenger. Uh, he may refer to a human being. It may refer to what we think of angelic beings like a, a Gabriel or a Michael. Uh, 
as far as angels are concerned. But the angel here, uh, maybe Gabriel, we, we don't know, but maybe Gabriel, uh, predicted five things about Jesus Christ. Just right here in the very beginning here of Luke chapter 1. First of all, it says, He shall be great, he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign of the house of Jacob forever, and in his kingdom there shall be no end. Now, when it says throne of his father David, now we know God is the father of Jesus Christ. But what we have here is the physical lineage of Jesus Christ. And it mentions him as his father because there is no word in the, uh, the Old Testament for grandfather. So father could be your uh, father, could be your grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, 14 generations back, still your father. And so, but we see here, it's, he's a descendant of David. He shall reign of the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So break all, each one of these down. First of all, he will be great. Uh, I mean, that is hard to expand upon. Uh, he is great. God is great. He is the greatest of all. He is the he is God. I mean, Jesus Christ is God. Uh, he will be called the Son of the Most, Most High. And, of course, this shows his equality with Jehovah. Uh, he is God in the flesh, incarnate. And so uh, uh, he's listed here as being equal with the Father. And, of course, that's very important for us to understand who Jesus Christ is. Those who deny the deity of Jesus Christ uh, cannot be saved. First uh, John talks about that. If you want to read the whole book of First John, uh, and you can read it through in one sitting, uh, five chapters, but a, a tremendous book on the uh, written only to believers, and gives us assurance of our salvation, and also tells us what a person uh, uh, has to believe in order to be saved. And one of those is that Jesus is God. So all the other religions who place Jesus up in a high position but don't believe that he is equal with God or that he is, he is, a, he is God, then they deny the, they deny the Father. He will be given the throne of David, number three here, in 2 Samuel 7, uh, 16, 14 through 16, 18, uh, if you read those verses there, David's son will last forever. Now, we know it's temporarily not being sat upon. Uh, the last king uh, of, uh, of Israel uh, uh, was taken into the Babylonian captivity. And so there have been no kings to reign uh, since then. But one day, the throne will return. I believe there's a, a temple in heaven. I think the Bible is very clear about that. Uh, I know the Bible is very clear about that, that there is a temple in heaven. And we know also know that in, in the book of Revelation, it says that there is no, no, at that time, there's no temple in heaven. So what happens to the temple in heaven? Well, it comes down to the earth during the millennial kingdom. And it will be on this earth for the thousand year reign of Christ, where he will sit on the throne of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of course, Jacob represented Israel here. And Jesus will uh, reign over him, uh, over Israel, and of course, over all people that ever was, that belonged to him. Uh, he will reign over them forever and ever. We know uh, about the millennial kingdom. We know a thousand year period of time. We know that if we were to die right now, we'd go to heaven. Uh, absent from body, uh, present with the Lord. Uh, then at the end of the church age will be a seven-year tribulation period. At the end of the seven-year tribulation period will be another thousand-year period of time, what the Bible refers to as the millennial uh, kingdom. And then after that, you have the great white throne judgment where Satan is cast into the lake of fire along with all the lost people uh, who uh, are, uh, live in the millennial kingdom will be cast in the lake of fire as well as death and hell. 
will be taken from the center of the earth and cast in the lake of fire. And then we have, what, we, for lack of a better term, is we have the rest of eternity. Uh, what will happen during that time period? Nobody knows. Uh, we will uh, serve God for that all eternity. Uh, there, there's no telling. But for the next thousand and seven years uh, minimum, if a rapture occurred right now, then we, the next thousand and seven years, we know what will happen to a certain extent. Uh, God fills us in, but then all eternity. And Jesus, of course, will reign not only for the thousand year period of time, but he'll reign throughout all eternity. And his kingdom, of course, will never end. He's going back to that same state. His kingdom will never end. So it's not just a thousand year again uh, that he will reign, but throughout all eternity. It says, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Lord God here is talking to David at this point. Um, it says, I'll be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the God of men. And of course, David did commit iniquity, and God did chasten him. Uh, and with the stripes of children of men, but my mercy shall not depart away from him. As I took it from Saul, talking about the, the king, the, the throne, Saul being the first king of Israel, reigned for 40 years, and because of his rebellion against God, uh, the throne was taken away from him, given to the tribe of Judah. Uh, goes on says, I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee, and thine kingdom, thine house, and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And so the, God is talking to David, saying that your throne will be established forever. Not that David will rule through all eternity, but the last king to set up on that throne, and the only true, really, king, uh, will be Jesus Christ, who will reign forever. John, or Luke chapter 3, we begin with the ministry of John the Baptist. We talked a lot about John in the book of uh, John, you know, uh, Life of Christ, book of John. Uh, John's message began about the 15th year of Tiberius uh, Caesar. So somewhere around 29 uh, B.C. Now, or A.D., excuse me. Um, Jesus was 30 years old when he began to, to his ministry. Uh, the dates are very confusing when it comes to the Bible uh, because our calendar is off about four years. Uh, we do know that uh, uh, John was six months older than Jesus, and so uh, about 29 as far as the dates here, as they stand corrected uh, from the Bible's uh, viewpoint here. But uh, John uh, served for about six months, and then Jesus came on the scene uh, and he reigned for, uh, served for three years in his earthly ministry, then he ascended up into heaven, whereas John did uh, minister for uh, three years. We don't know exactly how many years he did minister as far as the Bible tells us that he came, but he would begin about the age of 30, just like Jesus did. And uh, uh, his, he was, his job, we refer to him quite often as the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible doesn't actually call him the forerunner, but a forerunner was basically someone who came and introduced the next person. Uh, and so John's ministry was very short. Uh, he, he died uh, by being a martyr. Uh, but he died when his ministry was, was ended, was finished. Not finished prematurely, but when his ministry was finished. Because if God wants you to have a ministry for X amount of years, that's how many you're going to have it. And so God's not going to let you go prematurely unless it's due to sin. But if God's got a purpose for you, you know, Mark chapter 16 talks about uh, uh, taking up a serpent and drinking poison. And, of course, some 
churches, not as many as used to, uh, but there's still a fringe group out there who believe that churches should handle snakes and they should drink poison. And God doesn't tell us to do that. But God is telling us that if God has called us to do something, uh, remember uh, um, uh, Paul in Acts chapter 8, 28. When Paul was shipwrecked and they gathered there by the fire after they got to shore and they were sitting there talking to uh, the, the lost people, a serpent came out and grabbed Paul and bit him and the heathen, it says, that they thought, well, surely this man's a sinner because something bad happened to him, which is a false premise that we tend to think because something bad happens. Some people say, well, if something bad happens, that's because you did wrong. And sometimes it's not true. Sometimes if something bad happens, even if you do the right things. But Paul survived that. And how did he survive it? Because God had a plan for his life. He had time for him to carry on. If you go to Elisha and his students in his little ministry that he had, he was going out there and there was a famine in the land and when there's famine in the land, even believers suffer. And so they went to gather up anything they could find and they put it all into a big uh, pot and they boiled it all together and unknown to them, someone picked up something that was poison and put it in the pot as well and yet they survived it. Why? Because God wasn't finished with them yet. You know, with John, John, you know, there's two prophets in the Bible who go to the king and basically tell the king that you've committed adultery. Nathan did it with David, and then John does it with Herod. Nathan survived to preach another day. John died. Why? Oh, basically because God wasn't finished with Nathan. But God was finished with John. Why? Well, why is that? Remember what his, John, his job was? His job was to introduce the speaker, Jesus Christ. And once you introduce the speaker, what do you do? You sit down. Your job is done. John introduced Jesus Christ. After that, his job was done. God took him home. So he didn't die because... Herod had more power than God. He died because his time was finished. His ministry was completed. So he began his ministry about 15 years of Tiberius. Uh, John's parents uh, were a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And of course, they were godly people. Uh, Zechariah was a, an older man at this time. A priest would serve from the age of 30 to the age of 50. And after that, he would not serve as a priest as such with the sacrifices and all that. But his would be to burn incense or to do other things in the temple area. And his, so he was older at this point. Elizabeth uh, was uh, older, an older per woman at this point. And so they were godly people observing all the Lord's commandments well along in years and had no children and had no hopes of having any children at this point. And so they uh, were informed that uh, they would have. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. I'm going to talk about courses here in a little bit. Just a brief mention of where the courses came from and what they are, but of the course of Abiah, and his wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came past that while he executed the priest's office before God, in order of his course, According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And all multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, and there appeared in him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. 
But the angel said to him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now remember verse 15, uh, drink neither wine nor strong drink, that refers to a Nazarite. A Nazarite, not a Nazarene. A Nazarene is someone from the city of Nazareth. Jesus was a Nazarene, but John was a Nazarite. I mean, the, the vow was imposed upon him. God wanted him to have his vow. And he shall be filled or controlled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of children shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared before the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, Whereby shall I know this? He said, For I'm an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered, said to him, I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God, and sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these great tidings. Behold, thou shalt be dumb, not able to speak, uh, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen the vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them, and remained speechless, and it came to pass, as soon as the days of his administration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days where he looked on me and took, took away my reproach among men. So here God gives Zacharias the information that he would have a child, and his wife Elizabeth would have a child. Now, of course, as I mentioned a while ago, just a, a brief explanation of what the courses were and where they came from. We know David loved the Lord. And David, with all his heart, wanted to do something to please the Lord. And one day he was looking at his house and all that he had and all the splendor that God gave him, and he felt guilty about it. He felt that, he said, I have all these things, and God basically lives in a tent. The Ark of the Covenant was still in the tabernacle at this point. So with all his heart, he desired to build a, a house for the Lord, the temple. And he went to the priest, went to Nathan, and, and told him what he wanted to do. And Nathan thought, well, that, that's a good idea. And so he said, yeah, go ahead and build the temple. But that night, Nathan talked to the Lord about it, and the Lord told him no. Uh, David is a man of war. There's blood on his hands. I don't want a man of war. I want a man of peace to build a temple. And so Nathan had to go back and tell David that, sorry, but God doesn't allow you, will not allow you to do this. Now, the great thing about this is that David is the supreme ruler of the kingdom of Israel. Anything that he wants, he can have. If he goes against the law, he can pardon himself in that sense. And so there's got to be a certain amount of ego there. But when God tells him no, he's fine with that. And so what he starts doing is laying up in store things for after his death. His next son that would become king was Solomon. Solomon means peace, shalom. And God said, I don't want a man of war to build a temple. I want a man of peace. So Solomon was appointed to build the temple. And David had no problems with that. And David got to thinking about it. He gave, all, he gave financially to the building of the temple. He did everything that he could in his lifetime, but he wanted to do even more. And so he organized the priesthood and put them in different divisions. Uh, he divided priests into 24 different courses, or 24 different sections, if you would. 16 being that of the house of Eliezer, who was the 
high priest at the time, and that of Ithamar, and then the rest of the 38,000 Levites uh, that were involved here in the ministry were divided into 24 courses. Right? You had singers, musicians, porters, uh, those who basically did the, some of the physical things around uh, the temple area, officers and judges. And so he set each one of these up. And so from Solomon's day on, the priests were divided up in these different job descriptions, these different courses or categories uh, that David organized. And see, David wanted to do something great for God, and God said no. And it wasn't because David was not loved by God, but God wanted the mark of the temple to begin with time of peace. And so he selected Solomon over David. Uh, you might want to do something for God that is a good thing to do, and God might say, no, I don't want you to do it. See, we're not all appointed to be what we want to be. We're appointed to be what God wants us to be. And if you're in the will of God, doing what God wants, then you'll be satisfied with the calling of God whatever that might be. Uh, I know a lot of people want certain things in life. They want to be a, a pastor. Everybody wants to be the leader. Uh, I've never been a pastor. I've interim pastored in a church for uh, three and a half years, I think it was, or whatever it was, uh, uh, not too many years ago. And uh, 30 years ago, I entered another church. Uh, and I can interim pastor. I can do that. God has allowed me to, to do that. But I can never pastor a church uh, because I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, not because of sin, but because of the calling. Uh, God hasn't called me to do it. Therefore, I'm not qualified to do it. And so what we ought to do is be satisfied with the calling that God has for us, whatever that might be. For me, it's to be a teacher. I've been teaching now uh, for... Uh, 40 years uh, in this college and another college and Christian schools, a couple different Christian schools. Uh, that's what God's called me to do, and I am satisfied with that calling. Uh, it's the highest calling that I can possibly have because it's one that God's called me to. The highest, you know, sometimes we think, you know, because pastors will say they have the highest calling, and in the, for them it is the highest calling. But being a teacher, being a pastor, being uh, a Sunday school teacher, or whatever it might be, whatever God's called you to be, that's the highest calling that you can ever do. And you can have peace about it because that's what God has given you that desire to perform that ministry. And so with David, he was king, but God wouldn't let him build the temple. Paul wanted to be missionary in certain areas, and God stopped him and told him, no, I want you to go to Macedonia. I don't want you to go to Asia. I want you to go someplace else. Not because that place was wrong that Paul wanted to go to, but it's not what God had in store for him. And next week we'll look more into the life of John here in the book of Luke as well as the rest of the book of Luke.